so excited. Our next guest is an Emmy-nominated TV and film legend. Mm. Plus, she's one of our favorite TV moms, and when she's here, it feels like home. I mean, no place, child. Did I say that right? <laughs> That's a little 227 reference. Please welcome the one and only Miss Marla Gibbs. Hey! Right there, yes, take your do, time. Do, do, take it. Miss Marla Gibbs is in the house. Woo, woo, woo. Yes, give it up, give it up. We are so excited to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so you just look like a tall, graceful glass of champagne. Ooh. And you just celebrated your 90th. 90th birthday? 30 again, honey. I don't oh, know that's where right. you got that's your right. information. Right. Pardon me. <laughs> She's not great at math. <laughs> my, my, I'm so, my apologies. I need to know every secret. How do you look the way you do? How are you so radiant? And how is 90s treating you? Well, I don't know. One would not know that till they got the end of the 90s. <laughs> then you can say what it was. But when you're in it, you don't know what's going right, on. Right, right. Because all we get is one day, and that's yeah. today. That's, That's true. exactly That's very right. True. Exactly right. Well, you look like you're just you're glowing, and you look like you've had such a good life. If you're breathing, you've got a good life. That's right. <laughs> amen, amen. And I'm still breathing. Yes, you yeah. are. And yes, you are. So it's never too late. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Not only did you just celebrate your birthday, but you got your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. What did that feel like? Well, you... my daughter, Regina King. Yes. It was her idea. I love that. So she came over to Norman Lear's office, and we all met there, and they were sponsoring me, but they turned us down. What? Yeah. And so I thought, I didn't think any more of it. But the next year, they gave it to me. Yeah. So. <laughs> Because they got their minds right, yes. <laughs> now, you've played some major iconic roles over the years, and this all starts after landing your role in 1969 in Los Angeles. So what struggles did you face being a black actress at the time? Well, you know, at that time, we were not thinking about black actresses and white actresses. What you saw on the screen was mostly white actors. Yeah. And so you liked them, and you emulated them. Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, right. people like that. And, uh, but now, we, we see more. I mean, it's almost phenomenal. Yes, You agreed. cannot turn on the TV without seeing a black woman or a black man. Absolutely. Doing the news, and they're all beautiful. Yes. I couldn't agree more. It's beautiful <laughs> to see. Now, let's talk about one of your most memorable roles, which was Florence Johnson on The Jeffersons. Yeah. You were fantastic. but. Did I hear that you were working for United Airlines at the time of you getting the show and doing the show? I had been with United for 11 years. What? So I was not eager to give up my free passes. Oh, okay. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen with this. It was nice, but I didn't know it was going to last. Of course, and it's still running. Oh, <laughs> That's wow. amazing. Amazing. Okay, so what made you decide to quit? Well, one of the producers, Mickey, uh, Nichols, Ross, and Wes, and Mickey was uh, one of the producers, uh -huh. and he came and he said, do you still have that job? I said, yes, you ain't told me nothing to make me quit. You got okay. something to tell me? So, <laughs> so he said, well, we thought you might be tired. I said, no, I'm not tired. <laughs> you know, because you're off about five months during hiatus. Yep. And I said, I could be working at United. Right. Oh, <laughs> yes, double time. You know what smart woman you are. Very smart. Yeah. I also heard that for your character, Florence, that you channeled a bit of your grandmother and also your aunt from Chicago. So does that mean, like, any part of your character or your lines were improvised? Yes, that's the rhythm. Right. That they spoke mm. into in Chicago. Yeah. And most people know how they talk. So most people, whether they're white, Asian, or whatever, have access to seeing us and having people around them like, like us and hearing how we speak so they know. They know what you're saying. And so I kept it in. When we first started, we sat at the table and uh, did the lines with the producers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the actors get up and go sit down and producers and directors stay at the table. 
Well, I want to know what they were saying, so I stayed at the table. Yep. Oh, you did? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Another role we loved you on, you played the mom and the housewives, Mary Jenkins on 227, which premiered 37 years ago. What was the concept for that show? That came from Christine Houston, a woman in Chicago like me, and uh, she wrote the play. And we did the play, oh. my daughter produced it, and uh, she asked me to be in it, so I did. And then she told me I should try, try to get the rights. I didn't even think about that. Right. But I did go to Christine and say I would like the rights, and she said, well, now I gave them to Roy Campanella Jr., so she said, I'll give them to both of you. Oh. So I said, okay, so Roy Campanella had something going on at Columbia, and of course I was with Norman Lear, and we did go to Columbia first, and I wanted Christine Houston to be part of the show because sure. she wrote it. Right. And uh, he said, I work alone. So I said, oh. So I went outside, I said, well, he'll be working alone because he will not be working on 227. Oh, oh, I see one. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. So Norman Lear approached me on the, on the, at the studio and he said, I hear you have a great show over there. I said, I do. He said, well, I want to see it. I said, well, you better come tomorrow because we're closing. Oh, and uh, wow. now I had invited him a long time ago, but he didn't come, so I didn't think about it anymore. Brandon Tartikoff from NBC came, uh -huh. and he liked it. And uh, Scoey Mitchell is the one who brought him in. And then Norman came. He said, call my office. I did, and him and his wife and some of the staff came, mm -hmm. and they had to sit way in the back because we were packed. And uh, after the show, he said, well, what are you doing? Have you talked to him? I said, I'm talking to Columbia. He said, have you signed anything? I said, no, because they haven't got around talking about no money. Right. So he, <laughs> he said, well, call my office. <laughs> wow. So we set up a meeting, and he said, well, why don't you and I do it? I said, that sounds like a winner. I'm already over here. Right. And uh, so that's what we did, we ended up doing. I didn't know you could give the rights to two different people. And I can't remember, you remember all those names. Right. I don't even know what I had for breakfast yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and you remember all that. <laughs> now I wanna ask you, how did you know that Regina King was the right actress to play your daughter? Not only did she look like, have, have a look like Hal Williams. There she is. Yeah. There she is. <laughs> that's my baby. Aww. <laughs> I love, not only that, yeah. she was a professional when she came to the play. She was in the play, but she wasn't my daughter in the play. Oh. She was a little girl down the street who plucked my nerves all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the sitcom 227, obviously it paved a way for black people to be depicted on screen, and the long-running series was known for middle-class black people thriving, but they also faced the same situations and issues that a lot of people face. What do you think it was that made people gravitate towards the show? Well, number one, I insisted on having a man because people always ask me, why don't they let you have a man? Yeah. Oh. So I said, I would not do the show without a black man. Mm, I nice. said, I may not have him in the beginning, but I better win him pretty quickly. <laughs> At some wow. point, right, right. <laughs> so we got Hal, Hal was doing the play with me. Yeah. He was my husband in the play. Yeah. So I said, we already have the chemistry, so oh. all we have to do is get the lines. So eventually they gave in, they gave me Hal, they gave me Regina, who we said looked like Hal. She had light brown hair and light eyes. Mm -hmm. So I said, you could really believe that she was his child. Right, right, right. So right. we got her, and then I asked for Helen Martin, who played Pearl in the window. <laughs> oh, she was great. They didn't give me a problem with Pearl. They said yes right away. Right. And then Jack Hay came in yes. to audition, and she came in to audition for Rose, but then right. she asked if she could do Sandra. Oh. oh. And we said yes, and she did it with this crazy character. Yeah. And I said, nobody can top that. Yeah. Right. So I said, I want her. And uh, they said, no, the network wants someone else. So they named who they wanted, who I really liked too, but yeah. I couldn't see her doing this. She was a little too sophisticated mm. to ah. me. She had been on Broadway and all of that. Right. But Jack A, 
Nobody could have beat that audition. Still to this day. She's absolutely out of her mind. I agree. <laughs> I think the popularity of the show is that everybody gravitated to the sassy personalities, the one of a kindness, like you just said about Jack Hay. We know that 227 Jeffersons were pop culture, like iconic shows. And today's day, we're seeing a lot of reboots of sitcoms. Would you ever want to see a reboot of 227? Yeah, I think we said, I, as a matter of fact, my daughter's birthday was Sunday. She's in Aries. And Curtis Baldwin, who played Calvin on right. the show, was at the party. And so that was nice because oh. we keep up with each other. Nice. Yeah. So we kind of stay up with everybody. Oh. I doubt if Regina has time to do a reboot. Right, right. she's so busy. I yeah. told her, I said, you gotten everything there is three Emmys. I know. And Oscar, I said, how the hell do you expect me to catch up with you? Right. <laughs> Miss Marla, you don't show any signs of slowing down. I know you have other things, but I also know your motto is, it's never too late, and yeah. I love that. That's right. I love as that. As long as you're breathing. Now, when you stop breathing, it's over. Yep, <laughs> yep. So until then, keep going. Yeah. I hear you on that. Yeah. Mother's Day is coming up, and you being an iconic mother and a mother yourself, like, what does motherhood mean to you? Well, mothers are everything. Nobody would be here without a mother. Yes. They came through a mother. Yeah. That's right. So we are the epitome. I don't know why it taking them so long. <laughs> to understand that right. yeah. or to focus on that because they all had mothers. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Do you have plans for this Mother's Day? Give me some ideas. Uh, my daughter's in Atlanta. Okay. Doing, uh, being happy or something like that. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she won't be here. My grandson will be here and my great grandchildren will oh. be here. Oh, nice. That's the perks of being a mom, yes. That's perfect. Enjoy, enjoy absolutely. your Mother's Day. Happy we Mother's will. Day. So okay. I don't know what they're planning, but I'm ready for it. Yes. Oh, I love that. I love I'm that. I'm still breathing, so I'm ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Marla, thank you so much yes. for being here with us today. We are so overjoyed to have you. Um, you truly are an honor.